But you can really get burnt on that if you get to closing and interest rates are higher than you thought. You'll either be buying the rate down or putting more money down. When I started in the business, we would the highest leverage loan you could get was 15%, and a lot of guys wouldn't even take that because they thought it was too risky. What we like to look for is we want, ideally it's been an institutional type owner that owned it. They've done a lot of the heavy lifting. So they've went in, replaced roofs, windows, exterior, things like that. Today I wanted to do a quick solo episode, talk about the newest acquisition we just bought, kind of what our acquisition process is, give you guys a couple tips if you've never bought a property before, what to look out for. So the first thing, I mean for us, we look for a few things when we buy a deal. It's scale, it needs to be big enough, location, and can we get the financing we want, and then what the property's like. So this one checked every box. For us it was kind of the perfect deal, which is pretty rare to find, but the first thing, was the location. It's directly across the street from Nate, which in Edmonton is one of the it's the biggest one of the biggest trade schools in Canada. It's also one of the biggest schools that doesn't have any student housing. So right now there's not a lot of students in it, but there's still it's a huge job driver there. Lots of good good people working in the area. If you ever wanted to convert it to student housing, there'd be an endless potential of tenants. So check that box. Being directly across the street like that as well, it's on a huge piece of land. So it's on almost six acres of land. You have lots of upside potential in the future. Maybe Nate wants to expand. That would be the logical place to do it. Or maybe someone wants to move in and develop student housing. You know, six acres with only 94 units, there's tons of green space. So someone could come in and build hundreds of units, whether it's for student housing or just rental in general. You could leave the existing townhomes and go in and build a couple more rows of townhomes or apartments. There's lots and lots of upside potential there. So we really like the location. Um, and again, it had the scale. So we like to buy close to 100 units or up. We'll look at some stuff smaller if it's in the area or whatever that we like, or we have other properties in the area. But we don't want to be buying 20 unit properties. It's just too hard to manage at scale. I also feel that if we want to build up a big portfolio and go and sell it to someone bigger, maybe an institution in the future, or at least have them at the table, you know, wanting those properties, they need to be 100 plus unit uh, properties. So we can't be buying a huge portfolio of eight to 20 unit properties. I'd recommend anyone, you know, starting out, try to get away from that as quick as possible. They're, they're harder to sell. The people buying from you are less sophisticated. Um, <clears throat> so it's going to be a harder sell, in my opinion, to sell smaller properties a lot easier with bigger properties there's always going to be someone big there to, that wants to buy it for sure if you have a nice portfolio of them so this one definitely checked that box i've already talked about the land six acres so it's you know our biggest land parcel by far and then the second thing is just the actual unit count so it's 94 right close to 100 the big thing here is that it's townhomes so we really like townhomes uh, opposed to I, I like apartments obviously as well but townhomes you don't pay any of the utilities so you're a lot less volatile when gas prices go up or electricity right the tenants pay their own utilities and you're just kind of you you know you just collect the rents <clears throat> the other thing is there's no common areas to clean you have a lot bigger yards and stuff to take care of but you don't have any common areas to clean in certain areas where you're going to get broken into lots by homeless people and things like that you're not going to near as much with townhomes because it's actually somebody's house, right? The only door is gonna be going into someone's house. There's not a hallway to break into and sleep in or uh, you know, a, a lobby or things like that. So that's a big benefit. People generally, we found the tenant base in townhomes is a little more sticky. They tend to stay longer. You know, Maybe you're in a one bedroom apartment and you move into a, a two or three or into a townhome or into a house. But in a townhome, you can stay there for a long time. You can have a family in them, they're bigger. They have all the basement storage, so it's actually a lot bigger per square foot than, or you know, you have a lot more square feet than than an apartment. People tend to stay there longer. They treat them, I find, a little bit more like their own house than than an apartment. So I really like them. It's hard to find townhome complexes that big. <clears throat> you know, a lot of times they're built maybe ten or twenty or thirty, or they're built bigger and they're sold off as you know condo type units. But to find ninety four townhomes as rentals isn't isn't super common so we were really happy with that so it definitely checked the scale box and the next thing was on the financing so you know in this kind of property the 
it, it really hinges on the financing. There's not a lot of wiggle room. Um, unless you're wanting to put way more money down, everyone's going to come in pretty similar on, on values. The seller's going to go to a broker and say, what's the most amount someone can finance today? And the buyers are going to see what they can finance. And that kind of dictates the price. The downside to that is if you're pushing it and getting close to the full leverage you can get, it's really reliant on the interest rate, right? Because half, you know, uh, 50 basis points or half, half a percent interest rate up or down can give you a lot more buying power or a lot less. And that's where people can get um, pretty aggressive on the bidding. Maybe they think interest rates are going to go down, so they, they bid more. But you can really get burnt on that if you get to closing and interest rates are higher than you thought. You'll either be buying the rate down or putting more money down. So that's something you really have to look out for because you're, you know, you're 90 to 120 days out from closing when you put it under contract if you're using CMAC. So that's something where it's hard to know that you want to build in enough buffer, but you still want to be aggressive enough that you're going to get the deal. And things can happen like we were about one, we were one or two days away from funding. And that's when Israel sent some rock or uh, Iran sent a bunch of rockets over towards Israel. And all of a sudden, the interest rates went up, you know, 20 basis points. Well, on a, on a $20 million loan, that makes a big difference, right? So that things like that can happen. They're completely out of your control. You want to make sure that you build in a buffer so that you're not getting caught. Because if we were right at our ceiling rate and that happened, now you're all of a sudden buying the rate down on a big loan, you know, on a 10-year term. It can be pretty expensive or you're having to put a bunch of more money in because you're at full leverage. Those are all things that, you know, can somewhat be avoided if you have a really good broker and you actually take their advice, they'll know how much buffer to build in or have a good idea. They won't, they're not, you know, they don't have a crystal ball, but they'll have a lot better idea than you will. They'll also know, you know, what CMHC is looking for, where, you know, kind of what value you can get because to try to do that all on your own can be pretty hard. And I don't, I don't recommend it. You'll never, even if you try to learn everything you can, these people do this for a full-time job. Sure. They charge a fee for it, but it, it, I believe it's going to save you a lot of time and a ton of headache in the long run. Find a good broker you can trust. That would be, you know, one of my biggest pieces of advice. As far as um, the loan you take, generally, the, most deals that I see happen today are using the 5% down loan. <clears throat> and that's just a product of cap rates, you know, not going up and interest rates going up. So it's it's a pretty small margin right now. You need that longer amortization, lower money in in order to get the return out you want. So most people are using it, even people that used to put in. Like when I started in the business, we would the highest leverage loan you could get was 15%. And a lot of guys wouldn't even take that because they thought it was too risky. And even a lot of those guys today are now using this 5% down loan. If you're going to take it, you know, you either have to go in and do some kind of energy efficiency or affordability. And that can be, there's some little hiccups there as well. I mean, on the energy efficiency thing, you have to weigh out the cost of what that's actually going to be. If you're going in and rechanging out all the boilers and, and, or windows or lights or, you know, that could be a big, big expense. You've got to make sure you have the capital because you have 24 months to do it. If you're doing the affordability, which I think a lot of people do, because it seems like the easy way to do it, you got to make sure that when you get this, the time between when you get the COI and when you actually fund, rents aren't changing because you lock all the rents in. You say this is what they're charging and you're only allowed to raise it this little bit. And between then and when you fund, you're not supposed to change those rents. So the person who owns the building, you know, will probably be going in, renewing leases, moving people in and out. And those rents can change. That has to be rectified when you close. You have to make sure that that all lines up. <clears throat> That's just something that... Again, a broker can walk you through and help you out with. You don't need to learn that all on your own. But yeah, that's kind of the way, you know, everybody's basically taking those loans. And right now, you know, in Alberta, we use CPI rent and you can still raise even on affordable units. I think this month it's 13%. So it really doesn't affect it that way. There will be times though when you won't, you know, when inflation comes down or flat or, or negative, you know, whatever that looks like where you won't be able to raise rents. And then you are kind of, you're getting rid of a lot of the future upside. So if you, if you lock in too many of the units, so you can do different strategies and lock in less, but if you lock in 80% and you can't get rents up and you miss out on the boom that's coming in the next three years, that can really affect you. So there's lots of things to look at when you're putting a loan in place, deciding what loan to put in. And that's where, again, get a broker, get a professional to help you with that because <clears throat> it can go a long ways. 
The other thing we look at is the actual building itself. We don't buy super heavy value add. I don't. I, I personally just don't like that model. There's a lot of risk in there. Usually, you have to put money in, and you're trying to get it out with when you know with with within a pretty small window. I don't like the risk of that. Again, interest rates might there might be a war or something. It, may, it might spike way up, and now you're trying to refinance that money out at a way higher rate. <clears throat> we like to do stabilized value add. We want the property to already be stabilized. So this one, you know, in 94 units, I think there was one vacancy and it had a, a five-year vacancy of like 3%. So very stable. Rents were in a good spot. They were getting pushed a lot recently. So it kind of checked all the boxes. The building itself on townhomes, you have different things to look at. You know, instead of having one massive boiler system, you have 94 small furnaces. So that can be a blessing and it can also be a, a curse. You have 94 old furnaces that are going at different times. The upside is if it's minus 40 and one goes, you don't have the entire building um, out of out of heat like you do on an apartment building. So there's pros and cons. This one's split up over 20 individual buildings. So you have 20 roofs. A lot of them have been redone. What we like to look for is we want, ideally it's been an institutional type owner that owned it. They've done a lot of the heavy lifting. So they've went in, replaced roofs, windows, exteriors, things like that. You know, this property had a lot of that work done. The property we bought previously, the owner had just spent five million on the exteriors. He did all the balconies. Um, he, he switched from all the concrete balconies. He did the roof, the uh, siding, windows, doors. So all the heavy lifting had been done. That's all stuff that, you know, institutions will see the long-term value of that, a lot less maintenance. <clears throat> when you're buying from a small, uh, small investor or mom and pop type owner, they're generally trying to save all that big money and they're trying to spend money on the on the units. So they'll go in and renovate units where you get a direct increase in rents. Ideally, if you can buy from a bigger owner, they've done the heavy lifting, you can then go in and do the kind of the makeup stuff, go fix units up, get that direct increase in rents. That's kind of our our ideal purchase and that's that's what this property was. A lot of the heavy stuff had been done. We'll still change a couple more of the roofs, um, do some bigger stuff, but it'll be over time. But we can go in now, renovate those units that come vacant, and and push those rents. So, it you know it checked the scale box, it checked the finance box, and and the the building itself was we really liked it. So, that's all stuff we look for. A couple little tips that I'd recommend. You know, again, get a broker. That's the biggest thing. Make sure the location's a place that you not only want to be today. But you want to own that building. In my opinion, you know, wealth is built long term. So you want to be there in 10 years. If you have to hold it 15 or 20, you want to be in that area. We know that that school is going to be there for 100 years, right? So we know there's going to be jobs in the area. The city's going to spend money in the area because that's a huge driver of the economy. If you're moving into an area where the government's, you know, really subsidizing for builders to come in there temporarily, to try to change a neighborhood, <clears throat> you have to think long term, you know, what's what's driving that neighborhood to actually change besides people building new buildings? What's going to happen if those subsidies get cut or those tax incentives get cut? So buy in an area that you want to be in long term, use a broker, in my opinion, put that long term safe debt on day one, don't try to risk it. Nobody has a crystal ball. Um, we, we, you know, even on this deal, we were trying to decide do you go five or 10 year, we went 10 because I don't want the risk of Five years goes by quick and you haven't paid the mortgage down a lot in five years. So we want to just as safe as possible. We took 10 year debt. Um, if the deal works at, at 4% today, it's going to work a lot better at 2%. But if it goes up to six, you know, then you're in trouble again. So take long term debt. You paid the equity down. It's pretty rare that over a 10 year period, a building's going to be worth less than you paid for it or rents are going to be lower. So you have enough time to really stabilize the property, push those rents. And then just make sure it's a good building. I mean, building inspections can only go so far. Once you've bought some buildings, you'll have a good idea of things to look for. Um, you know, building inspectors aren't taking walls apart or, or going, you know, taking the roof apart to know. So you have to kind of use your own judgment. When was it built? What kind of upkeep? And that depends a lot on the person you're buying from too. So make sure that they've actually spent money to keep the property up. So those are a couple of the things I'd recommend. Anyways, that's it for today's episode. Like always, make sure you like and subscribe wherever you are. Share, share the podcast with people. We're trying to get out to more people. So thanks for today. We'll see you guys soon.